Okay, we should be live. So, welcome uh, everybody to this uh, new session. I should say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your local time zone. As a reminder, uh, for the questions, please post your questions on the uh, the, the Slack uh, channel corresponding to the author of the of the the first the name of the first author of the of each of the papers that is uh, so should uh, know the the system right now so for instance the first speaker will be Nick Collins and uh, his uh, Slack uh, stream is uh, Oct twenty one paper Collins and uh, and so on right so now we can uh, start with the the first speaker Nick Collins and his uh, co-authors. And uh, I will let him uh, introduce his, uh, his talk, uh, his title. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so, um, nice to be here, floating in and out of this background. I don't know if I'm really promoting Ed Sheeran albums or this is music from mathematics from 1962, but we'll just get on with my presentation. I'm going to share the screen. And jump over here. Um, so uh, I'm going to present some joint work with Rit, uh, Vit Ruzika and Mitt, Mick Grierson uh, on remixing AIs. Um, and I should say that we approach uh, in this paper um, machine learning from a more artistic perspective. Um, inspired in part by the uh, Bowers and Green paper where they uh, take a, a slightly more radical approach to means machine listening and its artistic contingencies. Um, if you talk about remixing AIs in general, it doesn't have just have to be machine learning. And of course, all the details are really in the paper. So I'm just going to give a little overview. Um, so Uh, I'm going to talk about some new creative applications by hacking machine learning algorithms. And I'm going to do two demos, essentially. The first demo is going to be an autoencoder based effects processor. And we're going to uh, manipulate um, trained neural networks live by signal injection directly into uh, uh, the units of particular layers, or even swapping layers between two neural networks of, sim of similar configuration. And then in the second demo, uh, we're going to talk about, the second case study, we're going to talk about an audiovisual network coupling. So there are audio and there are visual models and data um, calculation from the audio model feeds directly into the innards of the visual model to manipulate the visuals that come out. Uh, and underlying all this is a wonderful history of uh, brain transplantation um, of mind swapping, which has been a focus of uh, literature and um, uh, film um, for many, many years. Uh, and just a few of the precedents here are, are gathered on this uh, screen. I particularly enjoyed uh, the book by Robert Sheckley, Mind Swap, uh, but there's all sorts of other appearances of these sorts of ideas in popular culture. Um, and as a creative impulse, I think it's a nice uh, idea to explore. Of course, there are ethical considerations. Um, the more developed your artificial intelligences become, the more this becomes an ethical problem. But I think in the current era, we're not really at the level of consciousness yet. So hopefully you won't think I've done anything too cruel. Uh, where would you hack machine learning? Well, there's all sorts of different places uh, where you could um, uh, attack. Um, you might mess with the corpuses that we train up on. You might mess with the process that you use to train. You might take trained models and then play with uh, their parameters. Um, and you might even take their outputs um, and manipulate those. But the reason that this diagram is set up with uh, bidirectional arrows everywhere, and essentially I could interlink in all sorts of other ways too, I just haven't bothered to put in every single connection, um, 
is that we could have two training processes with two machine learning models that interfere with each other. For example, the training of one might um, critically determine parameters of the training of the other one, uh, or the output of uh, one model could determine what goes into the corpus for the next model. And this, this could continue on. You could have a, a third machine learning algorithm, third model that's somehow being disrupted by other processes. And, uh, so there's all sorts of areas that you could do um, manipulations and pure computer scientists uh, involved with very um, careful evaluation may worry that this is going to disrupt their ability to make amazing the accurate figures for their papers. Uh, but if we take an artistic perspective, there's all sorts of territory here to have fun with. So here's the first case study, uh, taking audio autoencoders. Um, so we have an audio file corpus. We go to log magnitude spectra, uh, typically 2048 bins. Uh, we train autoencoder networks in certain configurations. And then these become real-time autoencoders uh, as effects processes. So we have live signal coming in. And then we can dynamically manipulate the actual autoencoder or um, swap layers, for example, between two pre-trained autoencoders or inject signals into hidden units within autoencoders or do all sorts of manipulations. And actually with the software implementations we played with, uh, we've worked directly in JavaScript using convnet.js, but also working in Python with Keras to train models and then translated for real-time use to SuperCollider um, and to JavaScript again. Uh, and all this, the source code for this is available. Um, one technical um, diagram that I can put up um, is that if you have two trained networks, two autoencoders, and you interpolate layers, and this can be intermediate layers within these networks, um, of course you degrade performance as you go between the networks because you go to, co to sets of weights and biases, for example, that um, haven't really been the subject of a intensive training process. Uh, and so your loss, if you're measuring sort of error, it goes up a bit in the middle. Um, and But this is to also demonstrate that we have tested uh, interpolating, uh, swapping, doing this brain swap, uh, swapping between two neural networks. Um, another demo would be to look at audiovisual network bending. Um, so here you interactively connect audio and visual models to make audiovisual hierarchical systems. Um, the audio model is an LSTM uh, sample synthesizer, and then there's a reconnected uh, generative adversarial network uh, for image synthesis. We have coupling whereby the audio model outputs spectral flames. It's encoded by a variational autoencoder model, and these become the innermost hidden layer activations for the visual model. So the visual output is a consequence of audio generation. Um, this is the diagram from the paper. So we have um, the audio model eventually uh, gets down to a particular generated frame, which goes into the middle of a variational autoencoder. Um, uh, sorry, it goes through the variational autocoder, then the middle layer becomes the uh, input to the visual model so that the output visuals uh, follow through in a complicated way via uh, the machine learnt uh, model generated audio. Wow. Uh, right, so I'm getting towards the end of the slides and I want to get onto demos quickly if I've got time. So uh, in the future, we might talk of warping any existing machine learning algorithm for creative purposes. And of course, there are ethical implications, but we'll skip over those for now. But there are lots of papers, I think, developing there in the field uh, considering these things. And hybridization is a very natural creative strategy. So we like the idea of transplantation studies for AIs as a new field of endeavor creatively. Um, and you can all the these links are also in the paper where you can get the actual software and demos. But if I've got time, I'm going to jump out of PowerPoint. Um, and I'm going to actually try and do some demos. I think I've got time. Yeah, I've got five minutes. So uh, we'll start with Super Collider. Uh, so in Super Collider, I'll make the text bigger. Um, what I've done is I've trained up with Keras an autoencoder on Yazoo's track, Don't Go. We'll try playing a bit of that track just to prove it exists. I don't know if you really heard it or not, but I'll just keep going anyway. Um, 
so I, uh, that's the source. Of course, when you train up an autoencoder, particularly if you don't bother to do too many epochs of training, like I've done here, I only did 10 epochs of training, um, the sound of playing the audio through the autoencoder, even if it's the original audio, uh, to reconstruct, it, it won't have the same quality as the original. Uh, but that is all running in real time, so it's got this autoencoder that's been trained up beforehand um, and is loaded up as a soup within a Super Collider U gen, and then there's a back with uh, a back um, uh, process that um, does the calculations. Um, here's a slightly different model. This is 100 epochs. slightly better quality and then what you really want is the hacking right so we're going to now morph between two of these deep neural networks to these autoencoders from the 100 epochs model to the um, just the 10 epochs model uh, and the mouse is going to let me do the interpolation um, across the x axis in the screen and the y axis is going to let me choose which layer within six layers is actually being interpolated um, and the nature of the interpolation is just to interpolate the weights and biases for a given layer. There are different ways you might manipulate. So that was interpolating weights and biases, but you could also um, uh, uh, interpolate in a different way. Uh, we'll try mode uh, one. So in mode one, um, I in, uh, interpolate outputs uh, of both layer of both networks at up to a particular layer and uh, and put that back into the first network. So we sort of calculate with both networks up to a point, and then then use the first network just to end with. So it leads to various odd filtering effects that might be interesting. Uh, you can also dynamically inject signals, so I can have a buffer um, that essentially I fill with sound synthesis uh, to give the actual activations at a particular layer of the network, uh, which I'll do here, and that leads to much stranger results. Okay, and then I've got about two minutes left, so I'm going to jump over to Chrome and see if this works. So now to show the audiovisual stuff, um, work led by VIT, um, we're going to hear um, audio that's then being analysed via the models to come up with these, in, uh, these spectral frames that go into um, uh, the visual model to reconstruct. You'll see that the frame rate isn't that high, so in some sense it's a proof of concept. It's not um, road ready for high frame rate, um, but it should get across the principle. And I'll skip it for So I'm going to jump out of screen sharing now, um, and I think I've just about on my 15 minutes. So I've tried to give you an overview of what was in the paper. There's more details in the paper. If you need code um, or to spend a bit more time with examples, there's links in the paper too. And I suppose what I need to do now is uh, just check the Slack, isn't it? Um, maybe no one's asked a question of any sort. 
um, I see. Thanks, Bob. Um, so yes, will will YouTube uh, stop <laughs> stop this talk ever appearing? So there's a, one question, uh, Nicholas. Yeah, what other things did you try from Nicholas? Yes. Uh, um, uh, when you say what other things did we try? Um, so the experiments have taken place both with JavaScript in the web browser and with Super Collider. Um, if I just share my screen again, just for one sec, I think I've got time, haven't I? Um, uh, let's show you here. So these are the Super Collider UGENs that have been built and that are free to download. So there's one for morphing between uh, um, deep neural networks. We use a library called Crassify to go from um, Keras, uh, which can support a number of different kinds of neural network. It doesn't have to be autoencoders necessarily, uh, but that's what I've been working with. Um, and I had to make it real time safe and make it run fast enough, I had to hack that library. So you've, you've got the code for that as well. Um, I don't know if I should even show it at all. Um, where are we gone? Here we are. So this is the sort of source code um, you can get hold of. Um, so there's sort of straight playback from the model. Um, there's morphing between models and there's also this kind of activation directly. You have to have a buffer and you can just throw signals in. Um, in terms of what else has been tried with the audio visual models, I think that's a question uh, perhaps for uh, Vit and Mick. I know they're actively exploring various different models. Uh, Vitz just started a doctorate at, um, in machine learning, and I'm sure he's going to be trying all sorts of models in the future. I'll check the Slack again. Thank you, Nick, for the um, the, the answer. Actually, um, the was a Nicholas, another speaker in this session, who added, I mean, the techniques you present are quite specific. Did you s do some neural network manipulations with less interesting results? Oh, yes. Yeah. Sometimes um, the um, uh, the interpolants might just blow up like a filter blows up. So uh, and if you get the gain wrong, um, you just get explosions, go straight to silence or things like this. So if less interesting is um, failure, then uh, yeah, that can happen quite easily. Um, then Lance has sent a question about, your, we are training autoencoders on spectral frames. Um, the synthesis is um, in different ways, uh, but it's essentially the autoencoder is doing the resynthesis of spectral frames and then an IFFT to get back to um, uh, the time domain. Um, and I Artemi is asking, most of the generated outputs seem to be slightly noisier and more distorted versions of the original audio. And is it possible to have more nuanced control over the spectral characteristics of the sound output? Uh, yes, I'm sure it's possible to explore slightly more nuanced control. And I know Mick is, and his team are sort of very actively looking into uh, the latent representations and whether there's um, uh, better uses of other of, uh, control machine learnt models to uh, act on the inner activations. Um, but I must admit that in terms of demos, um, I gravitated towards noisy things. Um, and so Oded is sort of asking a, also a related question, a sense of how controller, but it ends up. Well, um, it, let's say that the paper argues for the creative possibilities of hacking machine learning and the uh, that it's nice to consider the idea of um, of transmogrifying um, deep neural networks in various ways. Um, oh yeah, beta alignment of trunks. Yeah, it's just um, so a set spectral frame size right now. Um, there's no beta lining of chunks. Of course, you could start looking into um, doing beat detection and uh, just taking snapshots across beats and et cetera, et cetera, having a bigger input. I, I, for JavaScript, I did do tests with uh, the current frame and many previous frames. The Super Collider thing uh, currently works just with the current spectral frame, uh, but there isn't any use of beat alignment right now. Okay, I think that's it. It was 20 minutes, wasn't it?
Thanks a lot, uh, Wayne. Time actually, you you did my uh, my job because you you read yourself the, <laughs> the questions, which is nice. But maybe uh, the the only uh, side effect is that the the audience cannot maybe doesn't have time to to check the 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 what were the, the question, even if you rephrase it. So for the next speakers, maybe it's better uh, for me to to read the questions, and but. Uh, 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 I will just uh, wrap up by saying it's. Uh, I find it very interesting, brilliant, even which is the, the last question, and uh, and of course I think you really would be interesting you for you to document like for patterns in a way uh, what what kind of uh, strange uh, uh, manipulations could uh, lead to interesting results and what are the the, the hyper parameters for uh, what, what kind of effect etc. Because you're the, the combinatorics of, of mixing uh, different kind of architectures and strategies is already huge, but you're adding uh, even more more freedom, which is uh, which is nice. Thank you, Nick. And Thank so you. We can, uh, we can uh, maybe just another question? No, I think it's uh no this was just a remark from GMO. okay so let's uh thank you and a very very nice and uh, we go now for the talk by uh Lance wise and uh, and also uh, second author is mohammed azaifa and the title of the paper is deep learning models for generating audio textures thank you Lance. you're on hi great i'll just uh Share my screen here. Yes, okay, so uh, I trust that you can hear me and I hardly have to say the title and the name again. Uh, Huz is uh, a graduate student who's uh, just uh, submitted his dissertation for review. And uh, this is work I've done in collaboration with him. Uh, I hope you'll permit me a little bit of an introduction uh, in lieu of uh, the beer or dinner that we would otherwise have uh, after these talks. Uh, in my lab, we do uh, work well over the past few years, a lot with musical expectation, uh, both psychologically and with improvisation systems, real-time composing improvisation systems. Uh, voice controlled synthesis where uh, Stefano Fasciani extracted uh, vocal timbres and used the control signals kind of as a third hand as a DJ, uh, vibrotactile chair from Saranga Nanayakara. So it's a mix of uh, science and creative works. Uh, but today I'll be talking about textures uh, with uh, neural networks. So I want to start off by asking what is a texture? Um, there have been uh, many uh, wonderful uh, researchers uh, putting together interesting work on synthesizing textures and thinking about textures. Uh, Demo Schwartz is amongst them, uh, Dan Ellis, uh, and uh, many uh, others after all. Uh, so what can we say that might be new? Well, I've always been struck by, you know, like timbre, texture is a very difficult thing to define, even though we all know what it is. Uh, so um, I just wanna, I want to move away from thinking about texture as being the property of a sound uh, and think of it as a way, a, a property of how we think about the sound. That is uh, a property of how we hear it, or model it or understand it. That's what makes a sound a texture or not. So the same sound can be a texture to one person and not a texture to the other. And I mean that quite literally. Uh, and I break it down sort of formally, semi-formally uh, this way. A texture is a class of sounds represented as a three tuple. So there's parameters that can be used to manipulate the texture so that it can be uh, dynamic. Uh, a is a set of attributes that we use to describe it. And then like Nicholas St. Arnaud did in the, in the mid nineties, uh, we talk about a window, uh, he called it an attention span, that has to be long enough so that over the course of that window, if you move the window around uh, in the sound in time, that the statistics of the sound will be uh, basically the same no matter where you take your window out of the sound. That would be a, a stable texture. But um, I wanna talk about, uh, so that the attributes don't change unless uh, the parameters defining the texture change. And uh, then a texture can be dynamic. In fact, a texture doesn't have to be stable at all. A texture is in some sense abstract in that way. It represents something that's stable. It's a concept that's stable. It's properties that are stable, but they can still be uh, manipulated through uh, parameters. 
Uh, so let me just play a couple of textures here. We all know uh, these dripping, uh, water filling a bucket. Uh, a clarinet is a timbre after all, right? After a certain window of time and it's not uh, changing except by par parametric control. Uh, the fact that the window might need to be very different size depending on the sound uh, is uh, evidenced by the wind sound here. Self-evidently a texture, but you have to listen to it for a long time uh, before you get a, a window that would have the same statistics no matter where you take it over the duration of the sound. Engine idling. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I will talk more about these uh, in future slides. Um, good, but we, we, we do note that an instrument timbre is a special case of texture. Good. So what do we want to do with texture modeling? Uh, well, what do I want to do with texture modeling? I want to synthesize, I want to train neural networks to be synthesizers under the kinds of control that I would like to uh, have and, and, and uh, give myself or, or musicians. So we uh, specify parameters that we want to use for interaction. Uh, for example, uh, the regularity of event generation or the rate of event generation, or in the case of instruments, maybe pitch. Uh, we absolutely need zero or low latency for synthesis. Uh, and I, I put quotes around real time because <laughs> I'm not doing real time right now, uh, but conceptually and in the model formally, uh, when I change parameters, the next sample that's generated immediately is affected by those parameters. What that does is rule out things like uh, GANs or any neural network that generates large chunks of audio at a time, every time a parameter changes, right? Um, so we also expect a generalization. Uh, we, we're not gonna sample the whole space of sounds. We, we wanna sample sparsely and then uh, move our parameters around and, and get the model to interpolate between them in the synthesis, in the, in the synthesis space. Um, we also would uh, love it if we could generate novelty by putting a couple of different instruments or texture classes, if you will, into the same space, into the same model, and then interpolate between them. Uh, Jesse Engel did this with uh, musical instruments uh, and uh, that was beautiful work, but what about uh, textures? We, we find that especially when they, you need real-time control. Uh, that if you only have a trumpet and a clarinet, you don't have data that's half trumpet and half clarinet. So there's a huge space uh, between those uh, clusters of uh, data that uh, interpolating uh, is a challenge for something like RNNs. And we want to generate sound uh, forever and ever if, if we so feel like it. Uh, timbre is defined outside of time after all. So that should be possible. So these two things cluster, these, these properties cluster into interactivity and novelty that we're looking for. Um, one thing we did is, is we start looking around for sounds that we can use for training neural networks. And we realized that there aren't a lot of uh, uh, these, this class of textures that is labeled as such. There's instrument databases, there's environmental sound databases that are massive thanks to uh, DeepMind. Uh, but uh, good labeled uh, sound textures with la labels that change smoothly through time are, uh, are hard to come by. So we started one and I hope that it will be useful to other people and that uh, right now you can use it. It's already up, it's small. Um, you can't contribute to it yet, but I hope that you're able to do that soon. Um, we also of course wrote software for writing the parameter files as you synthesize sound or record uh, play recorded sound and for uh, loading in uh, the metadata to train your data, uh, train your neural networks. So uh, this param manager plays nicely with PyTorch data loader and we're working on a TF record uh, reading and writing system uh, as we speak. Um, so in previous work, uh, I did this uh, uh, three layer RNN for musical instruments and it worked uh, pretty darn well. Uh, generally, the parameters were pitch, amplitude, and instrument ID. Why instrument ID? Again, so I could morph between inst multiple instruments that I trained the network on. Uh, so the input was a fairly low dimension. 
three parameters or so, whatever, and uh, a stream of audio represented by one real number. Uh, the input layer blasted it out to whatever the GRU dimensions were, which were small too, 40 to 80. And we got pretty good results. But these signals are simple, uh, basically periodic. And uh, as it turns out, when we look deeply into the network itself, almost every cell phase locks to the uh, period of the uh, pitch of the wave that's being uh, generated. So we asked, well, how about if we get more complex? Textures are, are far richer and have uh, much noisier kinds of signals. They're not periodic at all, uh, generally. And they include information at, at different time scales. And uh, that's what makes these thing, things particularly interesting right now. So uh, here you see in uh, the lowest figure on the slide, uh, events at one time scale that are kind of randomly spaced and the audio uh, signal, which uh, is happening at a, you know, different kinds of information due to different causes at a different time scale. So, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so uh, we, yes, so this does work for interesting texture. So I, we, we started working with this, these pops, pops like a Geiger counter sort of thing, sometimes with regularly spaced events and sometimes with randomly spaced events. Um, and what's interesting about these is clearly we could push our networks to test the ability to capture information at different scales. The pops, every single pop is different. So that's, they, of course it has a statistic, that it's drawing from, uh, but we expect our model to be able to generate uh, a lot of different timbral qualities with each and every pop. So the way that they were constructed, uh, every pop was different. So in the resynthesis, uh, manipulating only the rate parameter that we used for conditioning, uh, we get something that sounds pretty reasonable. So it's responding to the condition parameter and every pop has a, a nice different timbre, uh, so, so different noise samples. Similarly, if the, uh, the rate uh, is the same for this sound, but the, it's more like a, a Geiger counter and that the events are randomly spaced. And sure enough, this little RNN can do a pretty good job of capturing this behavior too. Speed up and then slow down. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I should note that, uh, yes, of course, that's a different sound with a different bandwidth, so almost pitched uh, because it's a narrow bandwidth that's ringing. So the, the thing is that you can do some uh, pretty fun things once you have these parameters. And so here's a bonus sound for you. Uh, this was uh, trained on uh, water filling buckets. And so now what I want to do is unfill the bucket by moving the parameter in the opposite direction, which could, of course, never happen physically. It struggles with this because we couldn't uh, give it a bunch of data files that all were trained at one parameter setting, right? The parameter is always changing, no matter how small the window is uh, when you're training. So uh, this was a tough one, but you can kind of unfill a bucket. You can hear that resonance deepening, uh, which is the resonance of the body of water itself. So it's uh, so it's unfilling. Uh, so the uh, what? So right. So you can see here in this slide that, that the slowest rates I'm using they're like four per second, right? So RNNs have this well-known uh, limitation on uh, capturing long-term time dependencies. Uh, you train them on music and they generate good sounding music as long as you don't listen to it very long, but you realize it has no structure. Um, so similarly here where we're really pushing the network, um, it doesn't go down below. We, we're having trouble at 16 kilohertz sampling rate, getting uh, events to, to respond properly below four per second or so. So uh, we innovated and came up with a multi-tier system. So. What this is, is uh, this shows a three tier system. And here's my uh, control parameter that I'm using for conditioning. Let's call it the fill rate on the, on the water filling. So we extract out of the signal features at various sample rates. So the first one here is RMSE, spectral centroid and pitch. 
at 125 hertz. And we get a, an RNN, which looks a lot like the RNNs that we were using before, but only for this tier, and, but they're generating at 125 hertz. So they can span a much longer time scale and uh, grab these, um, these features over a longer time. Uh, we do the same thing at a higher time, at a faster time scale, uh, extracting MFCCs and getting a second RNN to predict our uh, MFCCs with conditioning input that is coincidentally the very things that we were using to predict at our previous tier. Now, these, uh, and then finally at the top, at the bottom tier, tier one, uh, we're uh, predicting audio based on MFCCs as conditioning input. These tiers are trained entirely independently. That makes it very fast, it makes it powerful and gives some interesting creative potentials that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, however, when you synthesize, what you do is you put the, you, you use the control parameter, generate your low time uh, features, and then use those as input to your next RNN for conditioning input. Uh, and it generates the MFCCs, which are at a higher sampling rate. Then you upsample those, feed them in with your audio, and generate uh, an RNN uh, in RNN style to predict the audio. So uh, that is giving us longer time scales. It's essentially working. What you're looking at here is a two-tier example. So in the uh, in the tier two, we call it conditioning input is let's say rate. It's generating RMSE and onset strength, these sort of averaged onset signals that are uh, in blue and shown here in the image. And then they're being used to condition the audio generation, which is the uh, audio samples that you see within the events. And uh, sure enough, we're getting something that uh, is making a lot of sense. The uh, conditioning input to the lowest layer is causing these events and they're capturing events at timescales that are much longer than we were able to do when we just had a 16 kilohertz uh, RNN, no matter how many layers we used there. So the tier idea is, is working for us. Uh, to look at it a little bit more closely, uh, we're, we did some event counting. So with a two tier model, the uh, blue dots are event counts as a rate parameter changes and the blue dots are the ground truth. Uh, and the counts uh, for this resynthesis uh, material are in these box plots and they match up very well uh, for the two tier model. The one tier model has apparently always been struggling uh, even though it, it uh, looks pretty good and sounds reasonable. Um, it's not as accurate. It's just not doing well, especially on the, low, on the slow sounds. So a zero rate parameter, this, the rate parameter is actually an exponent. So uh, that's corresponding to one sound, one event per second. So uh, we're getting really good behavior uh, even at that uh, rate now. Uh, and interestingly enough, these models extrapolate. So we, we speak of novelty. You, can, uh, you can't see it here, but uh, when you sample periodically, just like you, if you sampled semitones and wanted to do a glide, you can sample rates at various discrete points in, 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 this, in that parameter space and do a reasonable glide through rate space. But interestingly, you can also extrapolate with these particular models and this particular sound. <laughs> Sorry, I can't be more general than that. Uh, up to uh, a couple of times these, the, the rates here that you're seeing. So up to 20 times a second, we're still seeing uh, good rate behavior. That's novelty uh, generation. So why am I giving a talk at uh, music creativity? I'm talking about sound synthesis. Uh, well, I, I think of this uh, as being useful uh, musically in, in several ways, at least in an electroacoustic kind of way. Um, the, the way we think about textures and the, the, the way you can listen to the same sound differently and make it mean something different and relate it to other sounds through deciding what you want to use for your conditioning parameters and what you want to use as statistical distributions for your network to learn. Uh, that gives some really interesting musical possibilities. Um, there's generating uh, novel sounds through interpolation, extrapolation, uh, and we're doing some, uh, this is formally real time, right? You change the parameter and the samples change right away. And the multi-tier model allows for some really interesting uh, mixing and matching, not unlike what Nick was just talking about, where you can take the event generation that you've learned from one sound and use that to drive the audio generation of another. So that's the creative uh, musical side of things. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, Lawrence, for the, the great talk. And uh, uh, there are some, uh, some comments. Uh, people like the, I think, especially the, the, the unfilling the bucket. <laughs> but there are no real uh, questions, but more uh, appreciation. Maybe I have, uh, um, it's not really a, a question, but it's, it's more of, of a comment. Uh, your, yeah, at first it's it's very interesting work, and um, uh, your your free tires architecture has different rates actually, uh, but uh, the input is different, and it just reminds me of some uh, another architecture which is named the Clockwork Clockwork RNN. Maybe you know about it. Sure, or sample RNN too. There's different ones architectures that use different rates, uh, uh, but in fact, those those uh, systems all have communication between the different tiers when you're exactly. uh, training, uh, and uh, the there has been work on MIDI synthesis where you use one tier to train uh, string streams of notes, and then another RNN to train uh, note to uh, audio. And uh, so that would actually uh, be more akin to what we're doing here. Right, exactly. Actually, you, you anticipated my, uh, my, uh, my, at the end of my comment, I didn't mention, I, I didn't want to say that it's, uh, it's similar, actually it's different, which is interesting because as you mentioned in the Clockwork RNN, this is the same input, but there are some uh, connection between the, 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 the neurons actually, because they work at different clock rate. In your case, these are different inputs, which are different rates. So actually it's very, uh, it's different. It's, uh, my my yeah. comment was just, or uh, proto question was just, it could be interesting to see actually, if you could model one, uh, remodel your, 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 your architecture in terms of this, uh, 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 clockwork type or no, and if not, why? Because it's a way to understand better uh, about the how it works, when it works, what are the limits. So just my uh, my little uh, question, but uh, I think yeah, for for future work. But very very yeah. interesting. Thanks again. I will have a last look at the yes. There's a uh, uh, there's a question. Uh, from Cosmos, which uh, who says, is upsampling performed with convolutions? Uh, can you ask the question again? Yes. Is upsampling performed with convolutions? Oh, no, no, no. No, it's just, uh, it's just straight ahead uh, uh, interpolating or even uh, holding something constant for that uh, duration. There's nothing, nothing uh, magical uh, about that. Perfect. And uh, that's, uh, there's actually was another uh, uh, a question uh, hidden by uh, Nicholas, who says, uh, what's the next step? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the interesting question. We, I'm really uh, driven by the ability to morph between entirely different classes of sounds. Uh, so we don't, when we train on different instruments, I, I, we, we kind of got some sticky behavior between you know, and trumpet and a clarinet, for example, uh, but it wasn't really a satisfying morph. So what do you do when, when you don't have data between those? Um, now, there are other architectures that are much better at generating, uh, inventing data that's between your sample points, even when there's vast distances between them. Yeah, I mean, you have to put this in a, in a relative frame. So we wanna combine uh, the different architectures and take advantage of them. Uh, to uh, figure out a way to <clears throat> invent uh, training data so that we can fill in that space and, and uh, get better morphing out of uh, our, these RNNs. We wanna stick with RNNs for their real-time synthesis capabilities, but we can use the other architectures to uh, generate sampling data, uh, uh, training data for our RNNs. Thanks a lot, Lance. Uh, great talk, like uh, the first talk by uh, by Nick and uh, it's uh, the session is running uh, very well so far. Thanks a lot. And Thank so you. All. Now we can <laughs> we can pass to the the further talk, uh, which will be by uh, Nicholas Jonasson. Uh, the, the the paper is from uh, Nicholas Jonasson, Bob Storm, and Carl Tomé, and the title is the Control Synthesis Approach for Making Expressive 
and controllable neural music uh, synthesizer. And this will be a, a pre-recorded actually because of, uh, of uh, internet connection problems. Hello, I will be talking about the control synthesis approach for expressive and controllable neural synthesis. Uh, this paper was written by me, Bob Sturm, and Carl Tomea at KDH and Epidemic Sound. Neural audio synthesis, as we've defined it, means generating instrument audio with neural networks. This means that we can learn to emulate instruments from data. This is which was trained to synthesize notes from MIDI input. Similarly to many sample-based instruments, it doesn't work well with instruments with strong note-to-note -note timber dependencies, like the violin, for example. More recently, fast and flexible neural audio synthesis and differentiable digital signal processing used continuous pitch and loudness contours to condition their synthesis models. This continuous control means that we can now expressively emulate instruments, even if they have strong note-to-note -note timber dependencies. We can generate the speech and loudness contours either by drawing them in by hand or by using an MPE controller. We can also extract these contours from instrument recordings. However, if the shape of these pitch and loudness contours that we extract are not similar to the shape of the pitch and loudness contours of the target instrument, we will not get a very faithful emulation. So imagine that we take the pitch and loudness contours from a piano uh, we won't get a, a faithful saxophone emulation, uh, no matter how good that synthesis model is. Our paper asked the question, can we find a convenient way to control these synthesis models? More specifically, can we generate uh, control signals for the synthesis models from low resolution user input? More concretely, can we transform MIDI into expressive pitch and loudness contours? So, um, our approach uses a control model in order to transform user input into a set of features which the synthesis model then uses to synthesize audio. Some related work has been done in this area uh, prior to deep learning in neural audio synthesis becoming popular. And these systems uh, adopt a performance instrument view of the synthesis problem. Um, this implies that the performance model models the performance and the instrument model models the instrument. Uh, the problem is that this boundary is not always clear. For example, um, if we think of a drum recording, is the loudness contour of this drum recording, is it a function of the performance or is it a function of the instrument? And the answer is probably both. The control synthesis model doesn't care about this performance instrument boundary. Our control model uses a bidirectional LSTM to transform MIDI pitch and velocity into continuous pitch and loudness contours. The synthesis model, which comes directly from the DDSP library, then transforms these contours into audio. So listen, let's listen to a short uh, example here. So here we synthesize this MIDI clip with uh, sine waves. Okay. And here we synthesize uh, the same MIDI clip with a trained control synthesis model, uh, trained on a violin data set. Um, the data sets we used were uh, chosen because they were uh, solo performances, monophonic, one performer, one instrument, one acoustic environment. We used one violin data set, uh, which was originally used in the DDSP paper, and we also uh, added a new flute, flute data set. Um, the synthesis models comes directly from the, uh, the DDSP library. All we did was retrain it. If you want the model details for this, uh, for this synthesis model, you can uh, check the, the DDSP paper um, or, or just the library. In order to, to, to train our uh, control model, we need to generate some input output pairs. So for each piece of audio, we use an audio to MIDI transcriber to extract MIDI pitch and velocity. And from the same audio, we extract loudness contours and pitch contours. 
in order to, to extract these, uh, this MIDI transcription, we used a very simple method and frankly, a very crude method, which um, starts out by just extracting pitch and pitch confidence with crep and loudness. We then detect note onsets and offsets by checking when the uh, pitch confidence crosses a manually set threshold denoted by this triangle symbol. If the pitch that semitone boundary, then we consider it uh, an onset and an offset. Finally, we assign MIDI note numbers and velocities by um, first we find the note closest to, av to the average pitch during a note event. And for the velocity, we map it to the peak loudness during a note event. And when, then we transpose and scale the, velo the resulting velocity distribution to match uh, a reference MIDI data set. And we use Ma Maestro in this case. Here is um, a diagram of our control model. So at, at its core is a, a BLSTM, and then there are some fancy uh, skip connections and some scaling stuff. Uh, probably very much uh, over-engineered, but it works. Uh, we can see this here. So here uh, are the um, input uh, MIDI uh, notes, uh, sorry, MIDI note numbers. Uh, in orange, the the solid line, gray line, the solid gray line is the um, pitch uh, target, the target pitch contour, sorry. And the, the dotted line is the uh, predicted pitch contour. We see that it follows the predict, the prediction follows the target quite closely. Here is the same thing, but for velocity and loudness. Um, so the orange boxes are the ve uh, MIDI velocities and the uh, lines here are the prediction and target of the uh, loudness. We can see that it's not as close as for the pitch, um, but it does okay. Let's listen to some results of the, the full system. So first, here's an excerpt of the violin data set. And here is uh, the starting melody from Furelis by Beethoven, synthesized with a trained uh, control synthesis model. Same thing, but uh, for the flute data set. So you might have heard here in the beginning that uh, in the flute render, there are some interesting sounds before the first MIDI note event. We think that uh, this is due to the MIDI transcription being uh, insufficient. So the, the, there is essentially noise in, in the data set. Um, we also hear um, something that sounds a bit like a looping, uh, like, the, like a note is looping. In some examples, when we push the, the inputs into a space where, um, which is not represented in the in the training uh, in the in the training data set, we we can hear some strange and unrealistic timbers.
so we can hear that these lower notes sound quite strange. On the other hand, these notes don't exist on a, on a real violin. We performed some, some other experiments where we trained uh, a control model on uh, a data set A and a synthesis model on a data set B. Here we trained the control model on this uh, Irish fiddle data set. The synthesis model was trained on the classical violin data set we heard earlier. And here is um, Thurilis synthesized with a control synthesis model trained in part on this Irish fiddle data set and uh, in part on this classical violin data set. We also um, extended the, this neural network um, with a manual or, or like hand-tuned vibrato function here, where we just applied a low frequency and a low amp uh, sine wave to the pitch contour. Let's listen to this. So here is without vibrato. And here is with vibrato. I should also mention that a similar thing was done in, in fast and flexible neural neural audio synthesis. Um, but but this shows that this works um, in the in within a control model as well. In conclusion, the controlled synthesis model is a viable approach for turning audio synthesis model into uh, controllable and expressive neural music synthesizers. Thank you. Uh, and I guess I will now be accepting questions. Almost there. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, for a great, uh, another great uh, presentation and, uh, and paper and work. So there are some uh, questions for you. <laughs> so uh, the first question by Jason, how difficult is it to create one's own data set for this task? Does a MIDI representation need to be created for the recorded audio and aligned with it? Uh, yes, um, we we solved uh, that problem by building like a um, audio to MIDI estimator. Um, the one that we presented, uh, the one I just presented, was. Um, very simple, and uh, we also set a threshold manually on one of the data sets. So I would recommend uh, using maybe a, a, a data-driven um, uh, MIDI to, to audio to MIDI estimator. Um, so, I mean, if, if you can solve that problem, which there's a lot of literature on that, then yeah, you could just feed in raw audio, right? Um, but of course, like, the, if the alignment is not good, the, the output of the control model is going to suffer, right? Thank you. Uh, another question by, uh, by Gunnar, who starts also by uh, appreciation. Beautiful. <laughs> Modeling pitch dependencies makes a difference, but a performance is more, of course. Are you modeling timing and short delays as a part of the performance expression? Uh, the answer is uh, no. We um, take in MIDI as um, 
like that's what the user wants, right? We're not treating it as, as a score. We're treating it more in, in, the, in a scenario where um, the, a user has already decided um, the timing and, and, and the, the, these micro timings, right? Um, but of course you could extend it to um, add like an, an extra pre-processing step where you add these micro timings, right? Okay. Thanks, and uh, Bob, uh, actually a co-author, uh, is adding also uh, an extra uh, comment that will require changing timing to a large degree. A uh, uh, question by, by Lons. Uh, so your trained system would play notes outside the range it was trained on. How far out could it extrapolate? Um, so, I mean, just as far as, so uh, the input we, we gave uh, was normalized. So we normalized MIDI pitch to numbers between zero uh, and one. So uh, we have the range to, to play, to feed in uh, any MIDI note number, right? Um, however, uh, there is no guarantee that we sound any good. Like as you, as you heard, just going about half an octave outside, outside the range, it started to sound really strange. Um, so yeah, as, as far as you want, but, uh, it, we, it doesn't really guarantee that the results will be any, any interesting, right? Okay. Thanks. So one more, uh, question by Roger, uh, really interesting. Have you thought about other control input? For instance, we use scores with phrase markings and slurs to determine where to tongue notes for brass woodwinds. And strings have many more articulation possibilities. So, um, I mean, if you can detect them, right? If you can detect these properties in a, recorder, uh, in a recording, then you should in theory be able to, 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 get, to use them as input, right? Whatever you can do in the, in the in the, in the backward direction, you should be able to do in the forward direction. Um, we haven't tried it with, with our other input, but it would be really interesting to see. Um, I, I'm not a string uh, player, so I don't really know all the intricacies uh, that go into playing the strings, but I'm sure there's uh, people who play the string will say, ah, oh, all these parameters will be interesting to, to feed in. Um, Great. So a uh, question uh, by uh, Nick, who says, uh, first, great sounding demos. And I like hearing artifacts of stylistic transfer. So the question, I wonder if you could iterate with transcription of output audio back to MIDI through audio MIDI through mo uh, to model to audio MIDI to model to audio MIDI to et cetera. Sure. Perfect. <laughs> Long question and, and quick answer. And the last from, uh, uh, it's more of a comment of Lons. Half an octave extrapolation is pretty amazing. So it, it's related to his question and strange is indeed great. So I think we, and there's no more. I see that uh, Roger here is ty typing something. Oh, okay, okay. Then. Ah, okay, he, he changes but, mind. And also for uh, actually a comment for meta comment for Roger and for everybody is that you can still uh, because for instance for previous uh, previous uh, speaker Leon's Leon's actually uh, Roger your your question arrived uh, after just <laughs> when we started with uh, current uh, uh, presentation. But this is no problem. You can uh, ask questions, make comments every, any time. And uh, actually the, the, uh, these uh, streams of uh, communication of, uh, in Slack will, will remain during the conference and maybe after even uh, later on. So you can still, uh, still ask questions and the authors, uh, please check your corresponding uh, uh, Slack uh, channel to, to, to keep uh, looking at the input. So Roger, question now. Uh, also, it might be interesting to see Ning Hu's PhD thesis, never published e elsewhere, but extends our earlier work with much more automation and learning, plus learning a vibrato model 
And so he, he, he points uh, the, 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 the report, the physics, automatic construction of synthetic musical instruments and performance. So it's a, it's a comment, actually, it's not a question. Mm. So, so yeah, yet again, that's a, a great, uh, great work by uh, a student of Roger Dannenberg. Um, she also uses this instrument, um, uh, sorry, performance instrument uh, view, but gets uh, really incredible uh, results. Um, and I believe she uses actually a combination of some hand-tuned stuff and uh, some trained stuff for the performance uh, model. And then she used also, uh, I think she uses recordings, which she interpolated in some interesting way in order to synthesize. So uh, very much in line, like very similar to, to what we did. Um, we did maybe the, the 2020 neural network uh, approach. Okay. But yeah, great, uh, great uh, thesis. If you want to, to have a look at that. Okay, so you you knew that that work already uh, here. Yeah, I I, I cite it in in at least my master thesis, and okay. in the paper as well. Perfect. So thank you, uh, thank you, Nicholas, for the, mm -hmm. the the great presentation and the great work again. And so we can now move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mathieu Prong, and his co-author is Philippe Esling, and uh, the title is Signal Domain Representation of Symbolic Music for Learning Embedding, sorry, embedding Spaces, and this, this is a pre-recorded uh, video. Hello, I'm going to present our work entitled Signal Domain Representation of Symbolic Music for Learning Embedding Spaces. The concept of embedding spaces has emerged in the natural language processing field with the well-known word embeddings. The idea came from the fact that it is not possible to rely on the one note encoding for very large vocabularies like a language. Even if we limit it to 100,000 words, the dimensionality of the resulting space becomes way too large to be effective. So the goal of the NLP field researchers was to find a relatively low dimensional space for encoding words efficiently. To do so, they create machine learning models which embed textual data through the co-occurrence probabilities of each word and train them to predict the words which will occur in a certain context. Basically, it's like a fill in the bunk exercise. The two models which have been the most successful are word 2 vec and Glove. Both of them produce very powerful self-structured spaces where the semantic relationships between words has been captured. We can see two examples here where it clearly appears that the geometric pattern reflects high-level concepts of the language as the gender here on the left or the comparatives and superlatives for the one on the right. By using such vector as input representation, the NLP field has made colossal improvements for complex tasks like translation, sentiment analysis, or text generation. Motivated by this success, a lot of attempts have been made to mimic this process for symbolic music, unfortunately, without the same success. However, another approach for learning embeddings has emerged with the appearance of the variational autoencoders. As the classic autoencoders, this model is composed by two different networks. The first one, the encoder, projects input data in a latent space, and the second one, the decoder, tries to reconstruct the original data from its latent code. The main novelty came from the loss, which is composed by two different terms. The first for the reconstruction to be the closest possible to the input. The second term, the callback liber divergence, acts as a latent space regularizer. It forces the statistical distribution of the data in the latent space to be close to the normal distribution. This has the effect of preventing the encoder to isolate each projection and favoring the embedding vectors of similar inputs to be close. This framework has proven to be very effective for produce self-structured spaces. Moreover, their probabilistic nature makes them even more powerful because it allows to directly generate new realistic data by decoding any latent code. One of the most efficient VAE-based model which has been proposed for the symbolic music field is music VAE. This model has yielded very interesting results, partly due to two major breakthroughs. First, 
the hierarchical recurrent structure of the decoder, which decompose the latent code in many subsequences instead of trying to decode the entire output instantly. And then the design of a very efficient input representation of melodies. Each bit is divided into four time steps and take one of the 130 possible values. The 138 first ones correspond to the activation of the corresponding MIDI pitch. The do nothing event occur when the currently active pitch do not change and the not off event put an end to the activation. However, this system processes only monophonic melodies, which largely reduce the scope of, it, of its application. And to adapt it for polyphonic ones, the problem of the input representation arises. The most commonly used representation is the well-known piano roll. This easy to produce integer matrix describes MIDI pitches activation across time. It can handle every kind of music, but its properties make it inefficient for machine learning. Due to the small amount of not played sim simultaneously, this matrix is really sparse. Moreover, as the time axis is discretized with a reference quantum, usually the 16th note, there are a large amount of frame repetition. To tackle these issues, two major proposals have emerged in the literature. The MIDI-like representation, which relies on an event-based vocabulary composed by four MIDI events. The not-on events indicate the start of the corresponding MIDI note. Similarly, the not-off event signifies the end of a played note. The time shift event moves the time step forward by increments. And finally, the thread velocity event, which changes the velocity applied to all subsequent notes until the next velocity event. This representation is very compact and tackles all the issues previously identified. However, the vocabulary used is very large, which makes the reconstruction problem more complex. And all the attributes corresponding to a given note may be encoded at very distant positions of a sequence. That, you, that is why the not tuple representation has been proposed. In this method, each note is represented by a tuple composed by four attributes. The time offset from the previous note, the pitch, the velocity, and the duration. The encoding of each attribute is categorical with its own vocabulary instead of a large shared one. As the time offset and duration vocabularies can potentially be very large, both are separated into two smaller ones. The result is a tuple containing six elements for each note. In this paper, we propose a new method which allows to represent any polyphonic bars as an audio signal. In our context, this type of signal offers several desirable properties. Notably, the fact that it naturally contains polyphony as a sum of periodical functions oscillating at different frequencies. We can represent them in a time frequency domain such as the short term Fourier transform, which produces a spectrogram matrix. This process, this process being invertible, we can retrieve the original waveform from the spectrogram. And finally, the efficiency of probabilistic models on raw audio signal has been demonstrated by the recent WaveNet model, which has obtained very good generation results. However, this representation can possibly suffer from two major flaws. First, its dimensionality, which can be very large and which are imposed by the higher frequency contained in the signal. Second, the transformation from one domain to another usually produces phase effects in harmonic signal, which can modify the original waveform and alter the invertibility of the process. So, our method is defined by the following steps. We start by computing the piano roll from the score. Then, we map each MIDI pitches to of the matrix to prime numbers. This mapping has two desirable effects. First, it limits the harmonic relationships between each frequency. And second, it restrains the higher frequency to a relatively small value, which drastically reduces the dimensionality of the res resulting signal. We now consider our matrix as a pseudo-magnitude spectrogram. To be able to compute the inverse STFT, we need to transform this real matrix in a complex one. To do so, we add an imaginary part to it, which plays the role of the signal phase. Finally, we can compute the inverse STFT and obtain the signal-like representation of the score. As we said it before, and thanks to the prime number mapping, this process is perfectly invertible, and by following the inverse procedure, we can retrieve the original score. 
In order to compare the efficiency of our representation with the other ones, we rely on the embedding space learning task. To do so, we use the music VAE architecture for the four representation and train them on a common data set, the four voice harmonized chorals composed by Jean-Sébastien Bach. These chorals have the advantage of, so, of following very strict and, and non-musical theory rules which allow to quantify how well the different learned spaces are organized along musical concepts. Furthermore, it is easy to make data augmentation by transposing each choral while respecting the pitch run of each voices to ensure that transposed chorals are still correct from a music theory standpoint. So to compare the different learned spaces, we first relied on the reconstruction and Kyle diversion scores. Then, to analyze in a more musical point of view, we construct a synthetic data set which follows the music theory rules of the back chorals. Note that, this, note that is, this is only for evaluation purpose. None of these synthetic chorals have been seen during the training. <clears throat> we generate sequences of tonal function with first order Markov chain. Then, we expand this sequence as a four voice realization by randomly picking chords in major triads, minor triad, diminished triad, and dominant sevens. This defines what we call a skeleton. Based on them, we generate more sophist sophisticated realization by using non-harmonic tones like passing tones, neighboring tones, suspensions, and retardations without fundamental changes in the chord progression. Finally, we store the information which links the skeleton and their corresponding realization and the tonality of each synthetic bar. Based on this corpus, we can analyze the behavior of different spaces with regard of the tonalities. Indeed, an adequate clustering of the different tonalities across the space would prove its capacity to encode this high-level musical information. In addition, we can compute the distance between a realization and its corresponding skeleton based on the number of non-harmonic tones. In this case, if the space is well organized, we expect these distances to evolve proportionally with the number of additional tones. For the reconstruction score, we relied on the same frame level accuracy measure for all the four representations. We divide musical sequences into 16 frames and compute the accuracy as the ratio of correct and wrong active notes in each one of them. Note that we do not consider the true negatives because the number of non-active notes is largely greater than the number of active notes. And this has the effect of compressing the scores between very high values. To ensure that our implementation and training process are correct, we first train the model on monophonic melodies with the same procedures and the original music VAE papers, but with the choral dataset. As expected, it obtained a very good score for both the reconstruction and the Kyle divergence. Then we applied it on polyphonic melodies. As we can see, the models, are, uh, the models are unable to achieve the reconstruction of unseen data when it is trained on the MIDI-like representation. Due to the nature of this representation, even a unique error on a noton or note of events lead to an ill-defined musical sequence with notes that never end or never start. Concerning note tuple, the model have been able to encode information about the number of notes, duration, and time offsets, which are, in the most cases, well reconstructed. However, a large number of mistakes, of, of mistakes in the pitches of individual notes cause the frame level accuracy score to be low. In the other hand, great results have been achieved by the signal-like representation. It seems to improve the learning stability by preventing the exploding gradient problem, which occurs with the piano roll representation. Our representation decreases the loss of information due to the overfitting. This can be explained by the fact that even if we lose a bit of information on the pseudo audio signal, it will blow a bit the spectrogram, but not necessary enough to alter the resulting score. For the music theory analysis, we first embed our synthetic bars in the different spaces and plot the Tisney projection with different colors depending on the tonalities. It clearly appears that there is no tonality separation for the midi-like and the not tuple cases, where the spaces are totally unstructured. It is better for the piano roll representation, which highlights a more structured nature with a good separation between tonalities. However, the clusters are very sharp, putting forward the lack of continuity between, between data in the space. 
This is not the case concerning the signal-like representation, which shows smooth transitions between clusters in addition to a better separation. This proves the efficiency of our proposal to improve the encoding of high-level musical features like the tonality. In addition, we compute the distance between a skeleton and its realization in regards with the number of non-harmonic tones. This function is even not monotonic for the MIDI-like, the piano roll, and the not tuple, proving that the metric properties of these spaces do not reflect the musical theory. But for the signal-like space, these distances grow linearly with the number of tones, highlighting again the usefulness of our representation. Finally, we wanted to test the generative capacity of the, learn, of the space learned with the signal-like representation. To do so, we rely on a simple linear interpolation between two points in the space. We first embed two bars of the data set and keep the coordinates of the corresponding points. Then, we interpolate the coordinates of a given number of points between them. And finally, we generate the corresponding bars by decoding these latent codes. The generation usually provides a smooth evolution from one point to another, enforcing again the structural nature of the space. Here is an example. For future work, we plan to optimize the model for our representation. Indeed, we, for comparison purpose, we use the same model for every representation, despite the fact that they have very different properties. Moreover, several techniques have emerged for disentangle the musical information which are carried by each axis of the space. This could allow a better understanding of, the, of its structure and make the generation process more controllable. We can also test the efficiency of using the latent codes as input representation on downstream symbolic musical tasks. To going further in the creative application, we can implement more elaborate generation process than the simple linear interpolation. If you are interested in the research, you can find all the code on the GitHub page. Thank you very much for your attention and feel free to ask questions. Okay, we should be good. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, another very interesting presentation. I don't see uh, questions yet. <laughs> For your talk, uh, are you here, uh, uh, Mathieu? Yes, 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 oh, I'm here. Uh, so if there are no question yet, what, uh, oh yeah, there's a question, otherwise I, there's a question from uh, Shlomo. The idea of hashing categorical variables to prime number is used to solve issues of multi-hot encoding in uh, neural networks. Is this correct to say that this is what the mapping of multi-pitch uh, piano roll pattern into a unique signal, signal sorry, by the prime number mapping do? Did you understand the question? I... Uh, yes, if, if I understand well the question. Um... Did you hear me? Oh. Uh, no, there was a there was a glitch. There was a cut. So. Okay. So yes, there is a small difference because the prime number mapping uh, came from uh, just for um, replace the like real frequencies like there is uh, in signal in signal or the MIDI pitches, uh, but uh, it's not uh, the the representation do not. Uh, 
uh, do not, um, how can I say that, uh, just uh, depend only on that. The, we, we, we do not map uh, the, um, the entire piano roll to a, to a unique signal, but uh, see the piano roll as a spectrogram with a, with a few process like uh, this prime number mapping and the adding a, a, a phase and do the, the, the short-term Fourier transform to, so it's not really like a, like a mapping, I think. Okay. So actually, Shlomo uh, uh, rephrased his question. In other words, what is the role of prime number? So the, the prime number have, um, oh, the prime number have two roles. Uh, the first one is to, uh, to, to not have uh, like uh, harmonic uh, relationships between frequencies because we do not want uh, when we reconstruct uh, our uh, our uh, our score our original score uh, we do not want uh, uh, that th this harmonics add notes uh, uh, which were not in the original score so we do not want this uh, harmonic relationships. This is the first uh, role, and the second role it's to it's to 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 uh, it's uh, really to low to lower the the higher frequency of the because of the dimensionality of the final signal we will depend of the the higher frequency contained in the signal. So this mapping uh, uh, is here also to to lower this uh, this maximum frequency. Okay. Uh, thank you. There's a, a question by uh, Roger. Could you say more about the decoding back to symbolic or MIDI representation? Uh, the decoding back to symbolic. Uh, I'm not sure to understand this question. As to from the signal to the to the score. Maybe, I, guess, I guess so. Yeah, I guess that, that that's a question because in your in your architecture you can you said that you can uh, go back from the signal and to reconstruct yes uh, a MIDI representation uh, symbolic representation yes. So we are doing a short term Fourier transform on the signal. Uh, then we 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 compute the magnitude spectrogram. Uh, with this magnitude spectrogram, we doing the inverse mapping of this uh, prime number. So the prime number become the real uh, MIDI pitches. And with that, we are with a piano roll. And from this piano roll, we can compute uh, the, the MIDI score with like, uh, with uh, tools like um, uh, MIDI, uh, MIDI uh, in Python. So MIDI, MIDI Python and uh, piano, by piano roll something like that. There's another, uh, thank you. There's another question by Oded. Uh, in real polyphony, uh, it means a, a musical, not to engineering polyphony. There's a note dependence within voices as well as between voices. Do you think that your representation will maintain that or distort those dependencies? Uh, yes. I think it will maintain that because uh, we do not, our system, uh, we do, we absolutely not uh, uh, say to our system uh, uh, se uh, la uh, as a separated voice. We take the, the four voice together as uh, only one, as uh, only one. So, so we do not, uh, the, the, the model is not, uh, uh, aware of the multi voice of the multi voices, so I think uh, in a mono voices it will uh, it will be okay. Thank you, Mathieu. Maybe I, I can add uh, 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 some kind of continuation of that question <coughs> because your your model embedding model looks looks uh, quite interesting. And uh, so, what do you think could be the weaknesses of this uh, embedding model? Of course, it's a difficult question. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, to use it, but uh, uh, I think uh, that we could potentially obtain better, uh, better embeddings by 
by optimizing the arch uh, the architecture because we we start from the music VR architecture uh, but uh, for our signal like representation I think uh, uh, by by taking like uh, more convolutional uh, arch architecture it could be it could improve uh, the performance of the of the spaces thank you you're, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, great, another great, uh, great work and great presentation. And uh, I don't see uh, more questions. Actually, I would have more questions, but I could talk too much <laughs> later on. Yeah. Uh, and so let's uh, let's let's uh, go to the next uh, and the last, actually, uh, the last speaker who is, uh, uh, so the, this is a paper by Foteni Simistira Liwiki, Marcus Liwiki, Pedro Malo, Malo Perize, Federico Gerivisi, and Stefan Ostergio. I hope my pronunciation is not too bad. And the, the title is Analyzing Musical Performances in Videos Using Deep Neural Networks. And actually the, the paper will be presented by uh, Federico Gerivisi, and this is a pre recorded uh, video. This paper reports on a pilot study aimed at facilitating labeling of music performance videos with automatic methods. Reports on a pilot study aimed at facilitating labeling of music performance videos with automatic methods to support human experts carrying out the analysis. We investigate if state-of-the-art music performance. This is a challenging undertaking, since videos capturing music performance are particularly difficult to analyze, as the individual gestures performed by the artist may be very subtle and difficult to label, even by human experts. Gesture research has become an important constituent in understanding musical performance, bringing together approaches from systematic musicology, music psychology and music computing. In an article from 2013, Jennifer McRitchie and colleagues published results suggesting that performers use bodily motions as a way of corporeally manifesting their interpretative choices. The team analyzed motion capture data of the upper body gesture of nine advanced student and amateur level pianists performing two Chopin preludes. Their conclusions support the arguably self-evident proposal from Bruno Rapp's 1999 quantitative study that performers may express the same musical structure in different ways, going on to state that Repeated meaningful patterns in performance movement are therefore not incidental movements, but, as gestures are movement which carry meaning, are perhaps performance gestures relating to composition structure. These performance gestures, while idiosyncratic, are used by all performers to relay the hierarchical phrasing structure across performances. The method and design of this pilot study were built on data from a previous project carried out by researchers at EPEM and the Orpheus Institute in Ghent, Belgium. That study sought to combine qualitative and quantitative methods into a multimodal analysis of music performance. A central component was qualitative coding of perceived expressive gesture. The data was drawn from two rehearsals and two performances of a composition for 10-string guitar by the British composer David Gorton. The piece is titled Austerity Measures 1 and was premiered by Stefan Osterhoer at the Orpheus Institute Research Festival in 2014. The qualitative analysis was carried out through a method consisting of several steps, building on a basic procedure of stimulated recall. The goal was to detect expressive movement in the performance that were not immediately related to technical or sound-producing gestures. Stefan Osterhoer, the performer of the piece and co-author of the research, will tell you more about this procedure. 
Expressive gestures were identified and named with a code, with the start and duration of the gestures annotated using the software HyperResearch. This resulted in a rich list of codes involving the different viewpoints of composer, performer and two observers. Through a process of negotiation, these codes were conflated and were relevant, renamed, when a consensus on their expressive meaning was reached, or deleted when no consensus was reached. Each time an expressive event occurred that matched a code in the list, this code was added to the video. This resulted in two parallel annotations, which were discussed in a final common session. Here, all coded events for which in the end no consensus was reached were deleted from the annotations. The final result of the video analysis was one annotated file per recording, which were applied to all expressive events in the video where the four participants found agreement, and it is this negotiated perception aspect of the analysis that defined the final code list which can be seen in this slide. Most of the codes refer to bodily movements that have no direct result on technical delivery and don't explicitly produce sound, such as nodding, facial expression and expressive shoulder movement. But what all the codes have in common is that, through a process of negotiation, it was agreed that they represent specific bodily strategies for the management and communication of the musical structures. You will see from this very short video extract some obvious examples of gesture that we coded as expressive, such as nodding, expressive shoulder movement, expressive head movement, facial expression and frowning. Additionally, several layers of qualitative and quantitative analysis of audio data contributed to the previous project. However, for this pilot study, the code list describing the expressive gestures identified in the previous study and the four videos were used, leaving the audio analysis for a later stage. Hence, the rationale for this study was that the qualitative analysis provided a highly detailed account from the performer and the composer of the piece as well as from two musicologists, all making observations and negotiating their understanding of the gesture in these performances. Hereby, an automatic analysis of gesture in the video could be cross-compared to expert human observation of the same data. Let's see the architecture used in this work. On the top of this slide, you can see the original 3D CNN network architecture proposed by Hara et al. On the bottom you can see the adapted version used in this paper. We kept the first three blocks and retrained the fourth one with a few ReLU layers in the final block and two outputs reporting the presence or not presence of a class. The reported results on the test set shows that there is a correlation between number of samples and high precision and recall. For example, the class freeze has 80% precision, 72% recall, 76% F1 score, and 96% accuracy. It also shows that for some classes, the results are very bad due to low number of samples in training. Uh, note that the accuracy is still high because most samples are negative and thereby, thereby correctly classified. For example, the class Expressive Head Movement, with 8 samples, reports an accuracy of 92%, while the F1 score is 0. In conclusion, this paper proposes a method to facilitate the labeling of music performance videos, with automatic methods like 3D convolution neural networks in this case, instead of tedious labeling by human experts. The model was evaluated on a set of 18 music performance gestures, 
and reports an average accuracy of 85.7% and F1 score of 38.6% on the test set. Our model has a very poor performance with samples never seen before and this overfitting is caused mostly by two factors a very complex model our model has more than uh, 63 million parameters and the number of training samples is too low also the subjectivity of the labels the labels in the model represent features such as expressive head movements that are very subjective. The kernel dataset is small and therefore problematic, but the training accuracy points to this technique being promising for further study. So, in future work, we will consider using a simpler model, maybe an SVM, try regularization techniques to achieve better generalization results and maybe data augmentation. Our integration of audio was not the most recent state of the art, that is why we exclude it from our current work, but we intend to apply a multimodal approach using state of the art approaches in our future work so as to include the audio signal as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, for Taini and uh, Federico and all, uh, I don't remember all the names who participated to the, to the video. And uh, so time for questions. There's a question from uh, Bob. Uh, have you thought about having a ground truth created with mocap? Uh, mocap, I mean, uh, I guess it's uh, motion capture um actually we have some sensors when they they did the um, video recordings the the musician had uh, you they were using some sensors to record the body movements uh, but we didn't uh, use these um, values in our experiments in this study we use only uh, the annotation that was done from the experts so this this is a great idea and it will be great to also use this um, sensors data, but we didn't do that. Maybe, maybe in the future we, we will do that. It was due to time limitation, but we didn't do that. Uh, Bob is asking another. Uh, well, it's a, it's a comment. It's a propo proposal. Another idea: apply some interpretable methods to determine what in the video is causing particular activations. Could you? Uh, uh, I don't really understand what it means by that, that, that. The idea, if I understand, is that to try to see the correlation between some uh, some uh, um, classification by the by the architecture to some particular uh, uh, events in the in the video uh, to, to try, in a way, to to work. Uh, uh, backwards, that is from uh, from the from the to see what what activates the what are what are the the motives the yeah. video motives which uh, which will activate uh, specific uh, neurons and will will trigger uh, this or that uh, uh, classification. Yeah, I understand that that is a good idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And uh, there's one more, uh, there two more actually. Um, uh, you know, a question by KM. <laughs> you mentioned intention of predicting phrasing. How hard is it to segment phrasing based on the labels you found? Uh, it's not easy to segment phrasing. And it's also, I think uh, this is also a multi-label problem. So. Um, what I can say is that uh, we don't have in one frame, let's say, for example, we don't only have uh, expressive uh, head movements, but we, we, you can also have nodding and frowning. So it's a multi-label problem. 
So this is causes an extra uh, uh, difficulty in the in this study. And uh, yes, it was it was hard to segment phrasing. I see. Uh, one more question from Shlomo. How about gestures between two musicians in a duo? This might be more about structural signaling and coordination. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is very challenging. I don't know how you can tackle this problem if you have two musicians, but of course this is, uh, this is the future. I mean, the future is to be able to analyze uh, performance by a group of musicians, not only one musician. But as you can see in this uh, study, even with one musician, it's very difficult. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, may maybe I, I made a comment on, on Shlomo's comment. Yeah, I think because you, you focus somehow on the facial expression by the musician more than, than the, 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 the gesture. And, uh, and uh, as Shlomo points out, it's, it's very interesting for not for one musician actually why he would do some specific gesture because of tension, etc. But between more than one musician, it's very important, of course, because this means coordination and signaling. Yeah. And, uh, they but, communicate somehow between eh? with yes. other musicians like this. Yes. Yes. I, I actually maybe uh, I have a, a question because uh, you focus on facial expression and uh, and well, this is a starting work and uh, results are, are very very promising already, but. Uh, for instance, if I put myself in the in the in the role of uh, of a user, I mean, uh, for application, for instance, for pedagogy, for guitarist, for instance, that would be great if your system would could uh, recognize, for instance, when a guitarist is using a, 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 on his right hand sweeping method mm -hmm. rather than a, a standard method for using a plectrum or that kind of. And that would be uh, for the for the gesture that would be very interesting for. Mm -hmm. Analyzing the, the 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 style and the gesture and the techniques used uh, in the within uh, uh, the piece of music being uh, interpreted. But well, it's more comments. Yes, I agree. But uh, I I would like to add on what you said uh, right now about uh, when the musician uh, uses the right or the left hand. Maybe this is not so difficult to recognize because. If you use uh, CNN, for example, in the frame, you can detect the hand. And then if you detect the hand, you can see if it's a left or a right hand. I don't oh. know. OK, but no, maybe I, I, you misunderstood my, I said sweeping. It doesn't mean sweeping the, switching the hands. It's a, it's a different uh, technique for, okay. for playing a, a playing a notes, melody through a, like arpeggio which uh, so it's just a, a different technique mm -hmm. of using the plectrum by, okay. by it's not sweeping the hands. Okay, I, I'm sorry. No, I'm no, no problem. Yeah. I would recognize tapping or, mm -hmm. or, or other things. But anyway, it's, uh, are there more questions? No, I don't think there are some more questions. So I think we will close here. Thank you uh, for Taini Very and Felix for the nice work. Again, and uh, this is so. This is the end of the the session. We are in time. We are twelve minutes <laughs> ahead of time. And uh, thanks a lot for all the presenters. Very very interesting work. This which created uh, lots of uh, interesting questions and interesting answers. So I I would like to to thank again all the presenters and the authors and co-authors and all the audience for, for, the, for the numerous and interesting personal questions. Oops, there's still one more uh, question actually for you, for Taini, if you are still there. Yes, uh, okay, yeah. Great. yeah. So it's, in a way it's related to what I, what I said. Uh, I was thinking about techniques for, for right hand for, for, for using a plectrum. Uh, but uh, uh, Carlos Arana is uh, is uh, mentioning uh, picking techniques uh, because that's true with the, the the fingers. You have different kinds of uh, techniques, even for bass, for instance, slapping. Or you have a lot of different techniques for 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 hitting the the strings. So actually, it would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So what's your comment? Yeah, it, it will be very interesting to, to determine different picking techniques. I'm not a musician, but I understand that you can play a different way a guitar. Definitely, it will be an interesting future direction. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, for Taini. Thank you, Carlos, for the last question. And I think so. Now it's time to, to close this session. Of course, the conference continues. A lot of new, uh, lot of great, uh, great talks and uh, interaction. And uh, thank you again to everybody. And and.